In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor mistress, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, the which I have ever offended you, and the just to deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, announce the grace of God unto you, and in his stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive reading of the introit as printed in the bulletin. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my pleas for mercy. And your faithfulness answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. For in you do I trust. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. God on high. granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. 
Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Amos in the seventh chapter. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel, and the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread, and there prophesy. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. Nor was I the son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Now, King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, It is Elijah, and others said, It is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard it, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself 
had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias, daughter herself, came in and danced, it pleased Herod and those who sat with him. The king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths, because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess our saving faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, heir of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, the God of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, He hath not been, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. 
Christ Jesus. Amen. Our lesson comes from verse 11 of our epistle reading. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Your fellow redeemed. Predestination is one of those doctrines we really don't talk about all that much in the church. And the reason we don't talk about it all that much is because it can be kind of a confusing doctrine. Predestination means that God has chosen all people who will be saved before he even created the earth. Everyone who will be with him in heaven had their names written into the book of life before a single human being was on this earth. That was confusing for some because they take this to mean that, well, then maybe we as human beings really don't have free will after all. Because, I mean, if God knows if we're going to believe or not believe, and if he knows what we're going to do before we do it, it's almost like we're locked into our course of action. We can't change. We're just sort of following a script. But this isn't the biblical view at all. Saying God has predestined us to salvation is not saying we don't have free will. Of course, we have to admit that our free will has been broken. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, our free will is corrupted to the point where the only thing we're really free to choose is the wrong path. Once God does come along and give us the gift of faith, then he changes our free will so that we are able to choose to serve God and obey his commands, but that's only after God first reaches us and redeems us. But predestination doesn't rob us of free will. Some people also get confused at the doctrine of predestination because they think that it makes God the author of people's damnation. Their argument goes like this. Since God has chosen some people to be saved, that means logically God must also have chosen other people to go to hell. So once more, doesn't really matter what you do or what you believe, God has already chosen it, it's a done deal. This is actually the teaching of a, a group of people known as Calvinists. Modern-day Presbyterians still follow the teachings of Calvin on this. They believe that God not only predestines some people to be saved, but he predestines other people to go to hell. It's called the teaching of double predestination. And it does essentially make God the author of people's damnation. They never really have a chance to be saved. They're born to go to hell. This actually introduces yet another false teaching known as limited atonement. The belief that Jesus didn't really die for the sins of the whole world. Jesus only died for those that God had predestined to be saved. It's a teaching we roundly reject because, in fact, God's word rejects that. God's word teaches us very clearly that God wants all people to be saved. It tells us Jesus did die for the sins of the whole world, not just for the sins of those he predestined. Our God is a God of love. He's a God who does reach out with forgiveness even to his enemies. He saves the worst of the worst which is where we draw our hope because we know we're sinful and Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. So God chooses no one to go to hell from eternity. God tries to help all people. Those people who are ultimately lost to God eternally, they're actually the ones to blame for their own damnation, not God. I mean, it is a sad reality of our human condition that by nature we choose the wrong path. We choose to reject God's law. We choose to reject his word, to turn away from Jesus, to substitute our own ideas for God's word. 
When people are damned, it's their fault, not God's. God does everything he can throughout his word to try and save people. In the Amos reading today, it's a, a perfect example of this. God sent Amos to the Israelites to bring them his word to try and talk them away from the destruction they were choosing for themselves. Amos spoke God's words of life and God's words of law, and it fell on unwilling ears. They got so mad at what they heard Amos say, they literally told him to get out of their country and not come back. But God wanted to save these enemies of his. That's why he sent Amos to them in the first place. And Amos tried. And God spoke his word through Amos, but they chose to turn away from him. That's the true reality of our human nature. We human beings can earn our own damnation. It's not God's choosing us to be damned. That's a problem. But we sitting here today, even you know, believing we are predestined to salvation, we want to know how can we actually be sure that we are among those God is predestined to be saved. I've read some stuff from well-intentioned people who teach that if you want to be sure you're predestined to eternal life, then look at your works. Look at your life. Do you do the things that a saved child of God does? Do you resist sinful things like you should? Do you go to church as often as you should? Do you help the poor? Do you show enough kindness? Do you receive Jesus' body and blood? Is your faith strong enough? You know, a lot of people, they look inside themselves. And doing that actually will do more to drive you to despair than to give you hope. Because anybody who's actually honest with themselves, when they look inside, will see that the answer to every one of those questions is no. No, my faith is not what it should be. No, I don't resist sin like I should. In fact, I've fallen into some pretty horrible sins. I could give more to help the poor. I could show more kindness on every single account I come up short. So if we're looking for any kind of proof that we are predestined to eternal life, we are not going to find it by looking at ourselves. When Paul talks about predestination to the Ephesians today, he does not use this doctrine to drive them inwardly so that they look in themselves for hope. Paul uses it in exactly the opposite way, to drive them outwardly, to look to Jesus as their true hope and proof of being predestined to life. Just listen how Paul talks in our reading. Paul wrote, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. Paul's full of joy when he talks about predestination. He says that predestination means God has adopted us through Jesus. He made us his own. He brought us into his own heavenly family. That's the heart of predestination. It's a teaching meant to calm our fears, to assure us of how secure we are in the saving love of God. It's, it's a doctrine meant to assure us that despite all our inadequacies and failings, that nonetheless, God has still chosen us. From eternity, my friends, we have been covered in the blood of Jesus. He chose to call us by name and wash us clean in baptism and to give us his Holy Spirit and to secure our souls for everlasting life from eternity. We have lived every minute of our lives under God's plan for our eternal deliverance. It's a very hopeful doctrine, which means you don't have to 
get out there and try to quick do more religious stuff to assure yourselves that you're among the saved. God's joined you to Jesus. He's given you a Savior, and that alone brings you into his eternal love. Being a saved, redeemed people has a real effect on our everyday lives. Again, Paul said he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now that we are predestined and redeemed by God, our God has put a holiness inside of us that we, likewise, show to the world around us. It's not that we produce holy lives first and then God decides to pick us. Forgiveness molds us into the people God wants us to be. Holier lives are not a cause of our election. It's the fruit of having been elected. There are those out there who want to use the grace and the love of God as an excuse to persist in sinful things. They think that grace means they can sin all they want because at the end of the day, Jesus is just going to wash it all away anyways. So predestination for them actually gets turned against holy living. Figure they can hold grudges, they can refuse to be reconciled, they can commit adultery, get drunk, whatever they want to do, they can go ahead and do it because they're predestined to life. That's not how predestination works. The love and the grace shown us by God is meant to be a power over sin. It is God's gift to you to place a holier life within your heart to help you resist sin, to seek to be more obedient to God. Good works are a natural product of being predestined. They are not, however, a proof that we have achieved the right level and now we can be sure we are predestined to, save, to, to salvation. If you want absolute proof that you are predestined to eternal life, then the grace and forgiveness shown you today right here is that proof. You want to know if you're numbered among the saved? Then look to that cross. Look to your Savior hanging there and see the price of your sin as paid in full. That's your proof. You are chosen by God to receive this sacrifice and call it your own. And today God has given you the benefits of that. Through a human voice telling you your sins are forgiven, through the gift of baptism that you have received, there at the communion rail, God puts that eternal life in you, and you're saved. That's your proof. Paul brought this whole issue up to the Ephesians because he wanted them to find comfort in knowing that they were saved. And as much as they had Jesus, they had everything they needed for eternal life. And that's you too. And as much as you have Jesus, you know that you're chosen for eternal life. Your salvation isn't a fly-by-night thing where God basically is chasing you the whole time, just barely getting you through. Your salvation has been planned from eternity. It's been wrapped up in a Savior whose blood has been shed in your place, it is rock-solid certain. That's Christ's gift to you. So be comforted in your predestination for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
most merciful Father, from before the beginning of the world, you chose us to be your own. You have given us your Holy Spirit and grace to forgive our many sins. We pray that you keep us steadfast and true to you. Bless our faith that it might grow stronger. By your Spirit, order our lives that by our words and actions, others may know you as a God of love and mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Blessed Savior, you enrich our lives with love. We thank you that you have blessed Brent and Nicole Zosky with a healthy baby girl. Send your holy angels to protect Ashton Louise and keep her safe in your tender loving care, that she might be a child of heaven forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty Lord, watch over all those among us who travel this week keeping them safe on their journeys, and bringing them back to joyful reunions. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the many ways that you show us your love, for the blessings of church and of family, and for peace in our land and good weather. Most of all, we thank you for predestining us to receive your grace and forgiveness, and for including us among your saved people. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. graciously receive all of our prayers. Deliver and hear us. For your name's sake, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you 
This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.